you wrote, Gato is not the end, it's the beginning. And then you wrote meow, and then an emoji of a cat. Uh, so first, two questions. First, can you explain the meow and the cat emoji? And second, can you explain what Gato is and how it works? Right. Indeed, I mean, thanks thanks for reminding me that uh, we're all exposing on Twitter. And, and <laughs> it's permanently there. Yes, permanently one, there. One of the greatest AI researchers of all time, meow and cat emoji. <laughs> yes. There you go. Right. So, can you imagine like touring and uh, tweeting, meow and cat? Probably he would. Probably would. Probably. So yeah, the tweet is important. <laughs> actually, um, you know, I put thought on the tweets. I hope people. Wh- which do part as well. did you think? Okay. The, so, so there, there's three <laughs> sentences. Gato's not the end. Gato's the beginning. Meow cat emoji. Okay. Uh, which which is the important part? <laughs> the meow. No, no. <laughs> Definitely, um, that it is the beginning. I mean, I I probably was just explaining um, a bit where the field is going, but um, let me tell you about Gato. So first, the name Gato comes from maybe a sequence of releases that DeepMind had that named, uh, like used animal names to name some of their models that are based on this idea of large sequence models. Uh, Initially, their only language, but we are expanding to other modalities. So we had a, you know, we had uh, Gopher, uh, Chinchilla, these were language only. And then more recently, we released Flamingo, which adds vision to the equation. And then Gato, which adds vision and then also actions in the mix, right? Um, as we discussed, actually, actions, um, especially discrete actions like up, down, left, right. I just told you the actions, but they're words. So you can kind of see how actions naturally map to sequence modeling of words which these models are very powerful. So Gato was named um, after, I believe, I can only from memory, right? These, you know, these things always happen with a, an amazing team of researchers behind. So before the release, yeah. um, we had a discussion about which animal would we pick, right? And I think because of the word general agent, right? And and this is a property quite unique to Gato. Um, we we kind of were playing with the G A words, and then you know Gato uh, rhymes is, with cat. Yes, um, Gato, and Gato cat. is obviously a Spanish version of cat. I had nothing to do with it, although I'm from Spain. Oh, how do you wait? Sorry, how do you say cat in Spanish? Gato. Oh, Gato. Okay. Yeah. No. Okay. It okay. All makes I sense. see. I see. I see. You. Now it all makes sense. Okay. So, how do you say meow in Spanish? No, that's probably um, the same. I think you you say it the same way, <laughs> uh, but you write it uh, is M I A U. Um, okay, it's universal. Yeah. All right. So then, how does the thing work? So you said general is is. So you said uh, language, vision, and action. Action. How does this? Can you explain what kind of neural networks are involved? What does the training look like? And maybe um, what do you are some beautiful ideas within the system? Yeah. So. Maybe the basics of Gato are not that dissimilar from many, many work that comes. So here is where the the sort of the recipe, I mean, hasn't changed too much. There is a transformer model that's a, the, the kind of recurrent neural network that essentially takes a sequence of modalities, observations that could be words, could be vision, or could be actions, and then its own objective that you train it to do when you train it is to predict what the next anything is. And anything means what's the next action. If this sequence that I'm showing you to train is a sequence of actions and observations, then you're predicting what's the next action and the next observation, right? So you tr- you think of, of this really as a sequence of bytes, right? So take any sequence um, of words, a sequence of interleaf words and images, a sequence of um, maybe um, observations that are images and moves in Atari up, down, left, right. And these, you just treat, think of them as bytes and you're modeling what's the next byte gonna be like. And you might interpret that as an, act- as an action and then play it in a game, or you could interpret it as a word and then write it down um, if you're chatting with the system and so on. Um, so Gato basically can be, th- can be thought as inputs, images, text, video, actions. Um, it also actually inputs some sort of um, proprioception sensors from robotics because robotics is one of the tasks that it's been trained to do. And then at the output, similarly, it outputs words, actions. It does not output images. Um, that's just 
by design, we decided not to go that way for now. Um, that's also in part why it's the beginning, because there's more to do clearly. Um, but that's kind of what Gato is, is this brain that essentially you give it any sequence of these observations and, and, and modalities, and it outputs the next step. And then you off you go, you fit the next, the next step into and predict the next one and so on. Now, it is more than a language model because even though you can chat with Gato, like you can chat with Chinchilla or Flamingo, um, it also is an agent, right? So that's why we call it A of Gato, like the, the, the word, uh, the letter A, and also uh, it's general. Um, it's not an agent that's been trained to be good at only StarCraft or only Atari or only Go. It's been trained on a vast variety of data sets. So what makes it an agent, if I may interrupt, the yes. fact that it can generate actions? Yes. So when we call it, I mean, it, it's a it's a good question, right? What, why, when do we call a model? I mean, everything is a model, but what is an agent, in my view, is indeed the capacity to take actions in an environment that you then send to it, and then the environment might return with a new observation, um, and then you generate the next action. And this, so on. this actually. This reminds me of the question from the side of biology, what is life? Which is actually a very difficult question as well. What is living? What is living when you think about life here on this planet Earth? And a question interesting to me about aliens, what is life when we visit another planet? Would we be able to recognize it? And this feels like, it sounds perhaps uh, silly, but I don't think it is. At which point is the neural network a being versus a tool? And it feels like action, ability to modify its environment is that fundamental leap. Yeah, I, I think it's it certainly feels like action is a necessary condition to to be more alive, but probably not sufficient either. Um, yeah. So sadly, I- whole consciousness yeah. thing, whatever. Yeah, 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 we can get back to that <laughs> later. But anyways, going back to the meow and the tweet yes. and the gato, right? So um, one of the, leaps forward. And what took the team a lot of effort and time was, um, as you were asking, how has Gato been trained? So I told you Gato is this transformer neural network, models actions, um, like sequences of actions, words, etc. cetera. Um, and then the way we train it is by essentially pulling data sets of um, observations, right? So it's a massive imitation learning algorithm uh, that it, it imitates obviously to what is the next word that comes next from the usual data sets we used before, right? So these these are these web scale style data sets of people um, writing, you know, on, on webs or chatting or whatnot, right? So that's an obvious source that we use on all language work. But then we also took a lot of agents that we have at DeepMind. I mean, as you know, DeepMind, we're quite, um, you know, we're quite interested in learning um, reinforcement learning and learning um, agents that play in different environments. So we kind of created a data set of these trajectories, as we call them, or agent experiences. So in a way, there are other agents we train for a single mind purpose to, let's say, um, you know, control a 3D game environment and navigate a maze. So we had all the experience that was created through the one agent interacting with that environment. And we added this to the data set, right? And as I said, we just see all the data, all these sequences of words or sequences of this agent interacting with that environment uh, or you know, agents playing Atari and so on. We see this as the same kind of data. And so we mix these data sets together and we train Gato. Um, that's the G part, right? It's general because it really has mixed, it's, it doesn't have different brains for each modality or each narrow task. It has a single brain. It's not that big of a brain compared to most of the neural networks we see these days. It has 1 billion parameters. Um, some models we're seeing get in the trillions these days, and certainly 100 billion feels like um, a size that is very common um, from from when you train this, this, this job. So the actual agent is relatively small, but it's been trained on, on a very challenging, diverse data set, not only containing all of internet, but containing all these agent experience, playing very different, distinct environments. So this brings us to the part of the tweet of, this is not the end, it's the beginning. Mm -hmm. it, it feels very cool to see Gato, in principle, is able to control 
any sort of environments um, that, especially the ones that it's been trained to do, these 3D games, Atari games, um, all sorts of robotics tasks and so on. Um, but obviously it's not as proficient as the teachers it learned from on that, these environments. Not obvious. It's not obvious that it wouldn't be more proficient. It's just the current yes. beginning part right. is that the performance is such that it's not as good as if it's specialized to that task. Right. So it's not as good, although I would argue size matters here. So yeah. the fact that... I would argue always size, size always matters. Yeah, That's okay. a different conversation. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> but, but for neural networks, certainly size does matter. So um, it's the beginning because it's relatively small. So obviously scaling this idea up um, might make the connections that exist between you know, text on the internet and playing Atari and so on, more synergistic with one another, yeah. and you might gain. And that moment we didn't quite see, but obviously that's why it's the beginning. That synergy the, might emerge with scale. Right, might emerge with scale. And also I believe there's some new research or ways in which you prepare the data um, that might you might need to sort of make it more clear to the model that you're not only playing Atari and it's just, you start from a screen and here is up and a screen and down. Maybe you can think of playing Atari as there's some sort of context that is needed for the agent before it starts seeing, oh, I'm, th this is an Atari screen, I'm gonna start playing. Um, you might require, for instance, to, to be told in words, hey, this is the, in, this, in this sequence that I'm showing, you're gonna be playing an Atari game. Um, so text might actually be a good driver to enhance the data, right? So then these connections might be made more easily, right? That's that's an idea that we start seeing in language, but you know, obviously beyond this is gonna be effective, right? It's, it's not like I don't show you a screen and and you from from scratch you you're supposed to learn a game. There is a lot of context we we might set. So there are there might be some work needed as well to set that context. Um, but Anyways, there's so a lot that, of work. Yeah. On, so that on, context puts all the different modalities on the same level ground. Exactly. To provide the context best. So maybe on that point, uh, so th there's this task which may not seem trivial of tokenizing the data, of converting the data into pieces, into basic atomic elements that then could uh, cross modalities somehow. So what's tokenization? How do you tokenize text? How do you tokenize images? How do you tokenize games and actions and robotics um, tasks? Yeah, that's a great question. So tokenization is the entry point to actually make all the data look like a sequence because tokens then are just kind of these little puzzle pieces. We break down anything into these puzzle pieces and then we just model what's the what's this puzzle look like, right? When you make it, you know, lay down in a line, so to speak, in a sequence. So in Gato, um, the text, there's a lot of work. You tokenize text usually by looking at common, commonly used substrings, right? So there's, you know, ING in English is a very common substring, so that becomes a token. Um, there's quite well-studied problem on tokenizing text, text, and Gato just used the standard techniques that have been developed from many years, even starting from n-gram models in the 1950s and so on. Just for context, how many tokens, like what order, magnitude, number of tokens is required for a word? Yeah. Usually? Well, what are we talking about? Yeah, for a word in, in English, right? I mean, every language is very different. Um, the current level or granularity of tokenization generally means it's maybe two to five. I mean, I, I, I don't know like the this. statistics exactly, but to give you an idea, um, we don't tokenize at the level of letters, then it would probably be like, I don't know what the average length of, of a word is in English, but that would be, you know, the, the minimum set of tokens you could use. So it's bigger than letters, smaller than words. Yes, yes. And you could think of very, very common words like the, I mean, that would be a single token, but very quickly you, you're talking two, three, four, four tokens or so. Have you ever tried to tokenize emojis? Emojis are actually just... Um, sequences of letters, so. Maybe to you, but to me, they mean so much more. Yeah, you can render the emoji, but you you might, if you actually just. Um, yeah, this is a yeah. philosophical question. Is, is emojis an image or a text? The way we do <laughs> these, thing, these things is they're actually mapped to sequ small sequences of characters. Yeah. So um, you can actually 
play with these models and input emojis, it will output emojis back, um, which is actually quite a fun exercise. Uh, you probably can find other tweets <laughs> about this <laughs> yes. um, out there. Um, but yeah, so anyways, text, there's like, it's very clear how this is done. And then in Gato, um, what we did for images is we map images to essentially, we compressed images, so to speak, into something that looks more like um, less like every pixel with every intensity. That would mean we have a very long sequence, right? Like if we, we're talking about 100 by 100 pixel images, that would make the sequences far too long. So what was done there is you just use a technique that essentially compresses an image into maybe 16 by 16 patches of pixels. And then that is mapped, again, tokenized. You just essentially quantize this space into um, a special word that actually maps to these little sequence of pixels. And then you put the pixels together in some raster order, and then that's how you get out um, or, in, or in the image that you're, you're, you're processing. But there's no semantic aspect no. to that. So you're doing some kind of, you don't need to understand anything about the image in order to tokenize it currently. No, you, you're only using this notion of compression. So you're yes. trying to find common, it's like JPG or all these algorithms. It's actually very similar at the tokenization level. All we're doing is finding common patterns and then making sure in a lossy way, we compress these images, given the statistics of the images that are contained in all the data we deal with. Although you could probably argue that JPEG does have some understanding of images. Like, uh, <laughs> because visual information, maybe color, uh, compressing based, crudely based on color does capture some something important about an image that's about its meaning, not just about some statistics. Yeah, so, I mean, JP, as I said, it's very, the algorithms look actually very similar to, yeah. they use this, the, the, um, the cosine transform in JPG. Um, the, the approach we usually do in machine learning when we deal with images and we do this quantization step is a bit more data-driven. So rather than have some sort of Fourier basis for how you know, frequencies appear in, natural, in the natural world, we actually just use the, the statistics of the images and then quantize them based on the statistics, much like you do in words, right? So common substrings sub are allocated a token um, in images is, is very similar, but there's no connection. The token space, if you think of, oh, like the tokens are an integer and in the end of the day. So now like we work on, maybe we have about, let's say, I don't know the exact numbers, but let's say 10,000 tokens for text, right? Certainly more than characters because we have groups of characters and so on. So from one to 10,000, those are representing all the language and the words we'll see. And then images occupy the next set of integers. So they're completely independent, right? So from 10,001 to 20,000, those are the tokens that represent these other modality images. And that is an interesting aspect that makes it orthogonal. So what connects these concepts is the data, right? Once you have a data set, for instance, that captions images that tells you, oh, this is someone playing a Frisbee on, on, a, on a green field. Now, the model will need to predict the tokens from the text green field to then the pixels, and that will start making the connections between the tokens. So yeah. these connections happen as the algorithm learns. And then the last, if we think of these integers, the first few are words, the next few are images. In Gato, we also allocated the, the highest order of integers to actions, right? Which we discretize and actions are very diverse, right? In, in Atari, there's, I don't know if 17 discrete actions. In robotics, um, actions might be torques and forces that we apply. So we just use kind of similar ideas to compress these actions into tokens. And then we just, that's how we map now all the space to this sequence of integers, but they occupy different space and what connects them is then the learning algorithm. That's right. where the magic happens. So the modalities are orthogonal to each other in token space. Right. So right. The, in the input, everything you add, you add extra tokens. Right. And then, you're shoving all of that into one place. Yes, the transformer. And that transformer, that transformer tries to look at this gigantic token space 
and tries to form some kind of representation, some kind of unique uh, wisdom about all of these different modalities, how's that possible? Are the, do, if you were to sort of like put your psychoanalysis hat on and try to psychoanalyze this neural network, is it schizophrenic? Does it try to, given this f very few uh, weights, represent multiple disjoint things and somehow uh, have them not interfere with each other? Or is this somehow building on the, um, on, the on the joint strength, on wh whatever is uh, common to all the different modalities? Like what, if you were to ask a questions, is it schizophrenic or is it, uh, does it, is it of one mind? I mean, it is it is one mind, um, and it's actually the very the simplest algorithm. Which um, that's kind of in a way how it feels like the field hasn't changed since back propagation and gradient descent was purpose for learning neural networks. So there is obviously details on the architecture. This has evolved. The current iteration um, is still the transformer, which is a powerful sequence modeling architecture. But then. The goal of this, you know, setting these weights to predict the data is essentially the same as basically I could describe. I mean, we described a few years ago Alpha Star language modeling and so on, right? We we take let's say an Atari game, um, we map it to a string of numbers that will all be probably image space and action space interleaved, and all we're gonna do is say, okay, given the numbers, you know, 10,001, 10,004, 10,005, the next number that comes is 20,006, which is in the action space. And you're just optimizing these weights via very simple gradient, like, you know, mathematical is almost the most boring algorithm you could imagine. We settle the weights so that given this particular instance, um, these weights are set to maximize the probability of having seen this particular sequence of integers for this particular game. And then the algorithm does this for many, many, many iterations, um, looking at different modalities, different games, right? That's the mixture of the data set we discuss. Mm -hmm. So in a way, it's a very simple algorithm. And the weights, right, they're all shared, right? So in terms of is it focusing on one modality or not? The intermediate weights that are converting from this input of integers to the target integer you're predicting next, those weights certainly are common. And then the way the tokenization happens, there is, there is a special place in the neural network, which is we map this integer, like number 10,001, to a vector of real numbers. Like real numbers, um, we can optimize them with gradient descent, right? The, the functions we learn are actually um, surprisingly differentiable. That's why we compute gradients. So this, this step is the only one that this orthogonality you mentioned applies. So mapping um, a certain token for text or image or actions, this, each of these tokens gets its own little vector of real numbers that represents this. If you look at the field back um, many years ago, people were talking about word vectors or word embeddings. These are the same. We have word vectors or embeddings. We have image vector of um, or embeddings and action vector of embeddings. And the beauty here is that as you train this model, if you visualize these little vectors, um, it might be that they start aligning, even though they're independent parameters. There, there could be anything, but then it might be that you take the word gato or cat, uh, which maybe is common enough that it actually has its own token. And then you take pixels that have a cat and you might start seeing that these vectors look like they align. Right, So by learning from this vast amount of data, the model is realizing the potential connections between these modalities. Now, I will say there would be another way, at least in part, to not have these different vectors for each different modality. For instance, when I tell you about actions in certain space, I'm defining actions by words, right? So you could imagine a world in which I'm not learning that the action app in Atari is its own number. Uh, the action app in Atari maybe is literally the word or the sentence app in Atari, mm -hmm. right? And that would, would mean we now leverage much more from the language. This is not what we did here, but certainly it might make these connections much easier to learn. 
and also to teach the model to correct its own actions and so on, right? So all these to, to say that Gato is indeed the beginning, that it is, it is a radical idea to do this this way, but there's probably a lot more to be done and the results to be more impressive, not only through scale, but also through some new research that will come hopefully in the years to come. So just to elaborate quickly, you mean one possible next step or one of the paths that you might take next is doing the tokenization fundamentally as a kind of uh, linguistic communication. So like you convert even images into language. So doing something like a crude uh, semantic segmentation, trying to just assign a bunch of words to an image that like have almost like a dumb entity explaining as much as it can about the the image. And so you convert that into words and then you convert games into words and, and you provide the context in words and all of it. Um, and eventually getting to a point where everybody agrees with Noam Chomsky that language is actually at the core of everything. That's it's, it's, it's the base layer of intelligence and consciousness and all that kind of stuff. Okay. Uh, you mentioned early on, like size, it's hard to grow. What did you mean by that? Because we're talking about scale might change. Uh, there might be, and we'll talk about this too, like there's a emergent, there's certain things about these neural networks that are emergent. So certain like performance we can see only with scale and there's some kind of threshold of scale. So it, why is it hard to grow something like this meow network? So the Meow network um, is is not it's not hard to grow if you retrain it. Yeah. What's hard is well we have now one billion parameters. Um, we train them for a while. We we spend some amount of work towards building these these weights that are an amazing initial brain for doing this kind of task we care about. Could we reuse the weights and expand to a larger brain? And that is extraordinarily hard, but also exciting from a research perspective and a practical perspective point of view, right? So there's this notion of modularity in software engineering, mm. and we're starting to see some examples and work that leverages modularity. In fact, if we go back one step from Gato to a work that I would say train much larger, much more capable network called Flamingo. Mm -hmm. Flamingo did not deal with actions, but it definitely dealt with images in, in, a, in an interesting way, kind of akin to what Agato did, but slightly different technique for tokenizing. But we don't need to go into that detail. But what Flamingo also did, which Gato didn't do, and that just f happens because these projects, you know, they're, they're, they're different, you know, it's, it's a bit of like the exploratory nature of research, which is great. The research behind these projects is also modular. Yes, exactly. Um, and it has to be, right? We need, we need to have creativity um, and sometimes you need to protect pockets of, you know, people, researchers and so on. By we, to go you mean humans. Yes. Okay. And also in particular researchers and maybe even further, you know, DeepMind or, or other such labs. And then the, the neural networks themselves. So it's modularity yes. all the way down. Okay. All the way down. So the way that we did modularity very beautifully in Flamingo is we took Chinchilla, which is a language only model, not an agent if we think of actions being necessary for agency. So we took Chinchilla, we took the weights of Chinchilla, and then we froze them. We said, these don't change. We trained them to be very good at predicting the next word, is a very good language model state of the art at the time you release it, et cetera, et cetera. We're gonna add a capability to see, right? We are gonna add the ability to see to this language model. So we're gonna attach um, small pieces of neural networks at the right places in the model. It's almost like um, injecting um, the network with some weights and some substructures in the ways, in a, in a good way, right? So you need the research to say what is effective, how do you add this capability without destroying others, et cetera. So, we created a small subnetwork initialized not from random, but actually from um, self-supervised learning um, that, you know, a model that understands vision um, in general. And then we took data sets that connect the two modalities, vision and language. And then we froze the main part, the largest portion of the network, which was Chinchilla, that is 70 billion parameters. 
And then we added a few more parameters on top, trained from scratch, and then some others that were pre-trained from like from with the capacity to see. Like it, it was a, it was not tokenization in the way I described for Gato, but it's a similar idea. And then we trained the whole system. Parts of it were frozen. Parts of it were new. And all of a sudden, we developed Flamingo, which is an amazing model that is essentially, I mean, describing it is a chatbot where you can also upload images and start conversing about images, um, but it's also kind of a dialogue style um, uh, chatbot. So the input is images and text yes. and the output is text. Exactly. Um, and How many parameters? You said 70 billion, 70 for, billion for Chinchilla. Yeah, Chinchilla is 70 billion. And then the ones we add on top, which kind of almost, is almost like um, a way to overwrite its, its little activations mm -hmm. so that when it sees vision, it does kind of a correct computation of what it's seeing, mapping it back towards, so to speak, um, that adds an extra 10 billion parameters, wow. right? So it's total 80 billion, the largest one we released. And then you train it on a few data sets that contain vision and language. And once you interact with the model, you start seeing that you can upload an image and start sort of having a dialogue about the image um, which is actually not something, it's, it's it's very similar and akin to what we saw in language only, these prompting abilities that it has. You can teach it a, a, new, a new vision task, right? It does things beyond the capabilities that in theory the data sets um, provided in themselves, but because it leverages a lot of the language knowledge acquired from Chinchilla, it actually has this few shot learning ability and these emerging abilities that we didn't even measure once we were developing the model, but once developed then as you play with the interface, you, you can start seeing, wow, okay, yeah, it, it's cool. We can we can upload, I think one of the tweets talking about Twitter was this image from Obama that is placing a weight and, and someone is kind of weighting themselves and, mm -hmm. and, and it's kind of a joke style image. And it's notable because I think Andre Karpati a few years ago said, no computer vision system can, can understand the subtlety of this joke in this image, all the things that go on. And so what we try to do, and it's very anecdot anecdotally, I mean, this is not a proof that we solved this issue, but it just shows that you can upload now this image and start conversing with the model, trying to make out if it, if it gets that there's a joke um, because the person waiting themselves don't see, that doesn't see that someone behind is making the weight higher and so on and so forth. So it's a fascinating capability. Um, and it comes from this key idea of modularity, where we took a frozen brain and we just added a new capability. So the question is, should we, so in a way you can see even from DeepMind, we have Flamingo that this, this model approach um, and thus could leverage the scale a bit more reasonably because we didn't need to retrain a system from scratch. And the other, on the other hand, we had Gato, which used the same data sets, but then it trained it from scratch, right? And so I guess big question for the community is, should we train from scratch or sh should we embrace modularity? And this lies, like this goes back to modularity as a way to grow, but reuse seems like natural and it, it was very effective, certainly. The next question is if you go the way of modularity, is there a systematic way of freezing weights and joining different modalities across? you know, not just two or three or four networks, but hundreds of networks from all different kinds of places, maybe open source network that looks at weather patterns and you shove that in somehow. And then you have networks that, um, I don't know, do all kinds of, stuff, play Starcraft and play all the other video games. And they, you can keep adding them in without significant effort. Like uh, that maybe the effort scales linearly or something like that, yeah. as opposed to like the more network you add, the more you have to worry about the instabilities created. Yeah, so that that vision is beautiful. I think um, there's still the question about within single modalities, like Chinchilla was reused, but now if we train an next iteration of language models, are we going to use Chinchilla or not? Yeah, how do you swap out Chinchilla? Right. So th there's there's still big questions, but that idea. Is, is actually really akin to software engineering, which we're not re-implementing you know, libraries from scratch. We're reusing and then building ever more amazing things, including neural networks with software that we're reusing. So I think this idea of modularity, I like it. I think it's here to stay. And that's also why I mentioned it's just the beginning, not the end.